as a parent and as somebody who's from a large family myself, and it's always amazed me to, to see two people who are from the same family, grew up in the same home, they're siblings, they're, they have the same environment and things, and grow up so differently because people just do that. Everybody grows differently. We can see broadly different phases of development and growth and things, but individually, there's so much uniqueness within that. And the same is true for groups. Every group has its own personality, but at the same time, we can see these different stages of development and, and ways that groups function or fail to function well um, through these models and within these models. So there are a variety of different models that you can look at for group development. We're going to take a look at two of the, the more um, prominent ones in this video, starting with probably the most prominent uh, model for group development, and that's Tuckman's Phases of Group Development, so named because it was developed by a gentleman named Bruce Tuckman, originally published in 1965. And Tuckman, as part of his work, said that there are really four stages of group development, later adding a fifth. Um, so those stages were and are remain forming, storming, norming, performing, and then eventually adding adjourning to that process as well. So these are the Tuckman said, you know, effective groups go through all of these things and they're identify, identifiable characteristics for each of these stages as well. So let's take a look at, at what those are, those different characteristics that you may see during group development for each of these. Uh, first of all, in forming, you're going to see the need for a high degree of guidance. There's a, a lot of uh, outside guidance and, and, and internal guidance as well needed, though. There's a lot of telling people what to do and how it needs to be done and still sorting things out. So there's a lot of a lot of handholding that goes on in the forming stage of a group. Individual roles at this point are still unclear. You're not really sure where everybody fits in, what their strengths are, how they're going to be able to best contribute. So individual roles are, are pretty unclear in the forming stage and the processes are not well established. How are we, how do we make decisions? It's going to be majority rules. It's going to be more of an authoritarian thing where people bring ideas, but somebody makes a decision. How are decisions going to be made? How are we going to engage in debate and discussion? And what are the rules for that? Uh, what, when are we going to meet? And, uh, and how are we going to meet? Those are all part of the, the unclear aspects of the forming stage. So there's a lot of uncertainty and, and can present some anxiety for group members during that time. But there's also some excitement. There's some creative flow that happens during those initial forming stages as well. So, um, so you know, got to take the good with the bad, but usually that's where we all start off in, the, in that forming stage as a group. Eventually, we'll move into storming if, if the group continues to progress. You move into storming. And in the storming area, you, you see more individualization. You see people start to become a little more argumentative and a little less willing to just go along to get along and and they're, they're starting to, to try and make their presence clear and and, and uh, you know stake their claim to different things so decision making is more defined you've probably come to some idea of how you're going to make decisions and made a couple decisions already your purpose is clear you've identified what it is you're there to do and your individual purposes may be a little bit more clear as well the, but the team relationships are still a little blurry how do we work with one another what's my relationship with the rest of the team and and my expectations for working with them so those things are still a little blurry and so it can be a bit chaotic but still uh, there's a creative surge that happens in the storming as people you know, assert themselves individually that you want to take advantage of, but it can be a little chaotic and a little uh, confrontational at times in the storming phase of a group, but it's just all part of it. You got to put, put up with it, right? It's the terrible twos or the teenage years of, of adolescence. If you, if you're familiar with child development. So anyway, we have this storming phase in groups as well. Then with norming, we see that the relationships are becoming clear. Uh, it's, it's, you know, we have a better idea of how we work with other people, who we work well with, what we're expected to do with them and what our lanes are. Members are more firmly committed to the goals. We're starting to come around to this idea that it's not just me. It's about us and, and our group accomplishments. So members are, are more firmly committed to the goals of the group rather than to themselves as an individual and processes here are optimizing. We have now a clear way of making decisions, a clear clear process for engaging in discussion, a clear process for communicating with the rest of our team. Those things are all kind of ironed out when we get to the norming phase and we're starting to, to hum along a little bit here. Eventually, ideally, a group will get into what we call the performing stage. In the performing stage, every group member is committed to performing well, not just to the success of the group or to whatever, but they're committed to doing their job and doing it well for the benefit of the group and, and, and for the group to perform well as well. And there's also a focus on being strategic. 
meetings may become shorter because you're, you're more focused on what it is you're doing you're in, you're out, you're on with the processes, you're doing these things. And so you have a better um, kind of uh, respect for people's time and their talents and their skills. And, and you're, so you're being strategic in the way that you're organizing things and the way you're handling tasks and things as a group. And the group at this point functions well with little oversight. Once you get into the performing stage, there's going to be really very little outside um, uh, structure needed or, or, or oversight or, um, uh, you know, so outside interjection won't be necessary. Be, the group will be able to do things well on their own. Eventually, the group is going to either, you know, time out or, or have performed their tasks or whatever it is, but you're going to adjourn. You're going to close things out and be done as a group. That can happen for a variety of reasons. Obviously, you can, again, you can accomplish your task or the, you're putting on an event and that event date is, is coming past, um, or just it fizzles out for whatever reason. There are a lot of reasons that groups end, but, uh, for, you know, at some point they're all going to end. They're going to adjourn. Now, this can be bittersweet. If you're really enjoying this group, you may be sad that it's, that it's ending. And, you know, if you're really finding your place there, but, uh, that so, but some people are also, you know, glad to have that time back and not have that, that extra work or whatever it is, not have that extra concern of working in that group. So it can be a little bittersweet. It can be, you know, have positives and negatives for, for group members. This is a time to debrief and celebrate as we'll discuss. This is a time to figure out what you did well, both as a group and individuals, what you did well, what lessons can you take away from this? And what can we celebrate about the work that the group has accomplished, about the things that you've done together? So you see that these are all, you know, part of the, all these stages, right? So let's take a look, though, it's more specifically at what needs to happen as a group and as a group leader, what, what we need to be focused on during each of these stages. So in the forming stage, um, the thing that's, that we need to do include, first of all, you ought to plan an icebreaker very early on. And I'm not an icebreaker. I hate icebreakers. I hate participating in them, but they do serve a purpose. They help you get to know your group members, and, and especially if they're task-focused icebreakers, if you can figure that out. But you don't have to do these every time and they don't have to be really cheesy, but you do want to plan some way for you to, to get to know your group members and start to develop some sort of connection with them and understanding of who they are. That'll help you find common ground that you want to find common ground with these people. What is it that we're all here to do? You don't have to be BFFs with everybody on your group and everybody on your team. You don't have to, to, you know, socialize a lot outside of work or outside of the team or whatever, but you need to find some common ground. What is it that you're there to do that you can all find uh, you know, that you're, that you're all there to do, that you can, some connection that you can find between all of you or between you and another team member to find that common ground. That's important during the forming stages. You want to establish goals for your, for yourself as an individual and also as your group as a whole, you want to establish goals. What is it that we're here to do? Let's define our purpose and, uh, and get some clarity about what we're hoping to accomplish. What does success look like at the end of this process? You want to clarify expectations about what you expect from people who are going to be a part of this group and um, what, you know, what are expectations in terms of simple things too. Like when you get a message from somebody from the group, what's the expected response time within, you know, how many hours or days or whatever, clarify those kind of expectations as well. And so you want to just, you know, again, start to lay some of the ground rules for your group interaction, for your group expectations and things like that. Okay. So once we get through the forming stage, we get into storming. And there are a few things we need to accomplish in this forming stage as well. A few things we ought to identify to, to, to say that we need to get these things done and have them done. First of all, we got to be willing to embrace disagreement in this stage. It's okay to disagree. That's, you know, bringing diverse perspectives and diverse ideas and things. That's a good thing in a group. So we want to embrace the disagreement. Uh, but at the same time, we want to keep it civil. Right. You can embrace disagreement. You can, you know, have disagreements, but you can do so in a constructive way, in a way that doesn't upset people or keep up from being productive. Right. So in order to do that, one of the things we need to do is to practice active listening, effective listening, active listening, not just letting it go in one ear, not the other ear or pretending to listen, you know, do pseudo listening, but not really listening. We ought to practice active listening so that we understand where the other person is coming from, even if we disagree with them. We need to understand where it is they're coming from so that we can try and persuade them, try and, you know, incorporate their ideas as well as ours and, and embrace that disagreement for the sake of embracing a different perspective, which could benefit the group. Uh, and through it all, we need to keep a sense of humor. It's important to keep a sense of humor. You, you, you got to have some fun with this. And again, it doesn't have to all be a laugh fest, but you just have to keep a sense of humor about things. When things go wrong, you just have to kind of brush it off and, and have a sense of humor and, uh, and be willing to accept others and, and in all of their faults. Okay, so let's shift gears and think about what we need to do 
once a group enters the norming phase of development. So uh, first and foremost, it's important that we get all the group members to adapt to the norms and that we do that ourselves as group members, but that we, you know, once we've identified those norms, we want people to adapt to them. We don't want to stifle creativity and kind of force people to do something they wouldn't naturally do. But, but once we've identified what these norms are, we need people to start following them. And so we need to adapt to them and, and ask others to as well. Now, at the same time, we do want to, to be free to challenge norms that are too strict. If there's something that's happening that's restricting the creativity or the flow or the efficiency of the group, we need to be able to push back on those things a little bit and be able to not only adapt to the norms, but adapt the norms as our group grows and as our needs grow and as we identify these things. So we need to challenge norms that are too strict. And at the same time, we need to tighten up norms uh, that are too loose. If there are norms that are that are keeping us from being efficient uh, in terms of um, things are a little too too loose or there's something we need to adjust. So we need to be able to, to move those norms as as necessary to challenge the ones that are too strict, to tighten up the ones that are too loose. But in general, once we've identified a norm, we need to adapt to that and get the group to work within those uh, strictures. When we enter into performing, there are some things we need to keep in mind as well. First of all, we want to stay task focused in performing. That doesn't mean that you can't have friendships or can't develop relationships, but those kinds of things need to happen outside of the group, especially once you get into performing. Everybody's kind of laser focused on what they need to be doing and doing well and doing most effectively and efficiently for the group. So the group really needs to stay task focused. We do want to encourage full participation at this stage. It's easy for people to be quiet and others to assume that if they're quiet, they don't have anything to add. Um, that's not necessarily the case. We need to encourage people to participate fully and uh, either as a group or as, a, as individuals approach those people and say, look, I just want to make sure we're not missing anything that, that you have to offer. So I just want to encourage you to speak up or let me know what I can do to help You'll bring your ideas to the forefront, but we want to encourage for full participation. That's the whole point is to have that diversity of ideas and diversity of perspectives and, and make use of all that. Then finally, we want to just coach and support at the performing stage. You shouldn't need a lot of oversight. You shouldn't need a lot of handholding. You shouldn't need a lot of authoritarian behavior, you know, punishments and things like that. It's really about just coaching people and supporting people to do the best job that they can. Eventually, when we get into adjourning and things are, are bringing, you know, coming, look like they're coming to a close, the first thing we need to do is provide a runway. Uh, to, to just end abruptly is not very satisfying. And it's it's just, you know, to just say, okay, we're done. No more. And everybody's kind of just left in the lurch thinking, oh, well, okay, that was kind of sudden. Um, but we want to provide a runway. We want to start identifying, you know, okay, we're coming to a close. So we need to bring this thing in for a landing. And so, okay, we're going to be wrapping things up. Just everybody be prepared for that. We're going to focus on this end date and, and having things concluded by them. But at least that gives people an idea that the end is coming and that, uh, that we're, we're bringing this thing in for a landing. So provide a runway for that landing. We also want to be sure we debrief for lessons, for lessons, sorry, both for individuals and as a group. As individuals, what worked well? What can we do better next time? And, and the same thing as a group. What went well here? What will we do differently next time for somebody working on this task? But we can debrief to, to kind of identify and express all of those lessons. We also want to acknowledge the work. Where's that we started? What have we accomplished during that time? And, and along with that, celebrate those victories that we see during that time, right? So acknowledge the work that you've done, celebrate the victories and just bring things around for kind of an, uh, to provide some closure uh, to everybody in the group. So really, we ought to be moving through these phases, not in a linear way so much, but, you know, you'll see some some regression during storming. But this is kind of the, the progression that things normally take. And it's sort of with that in mind, this idea that, that it's not such a linear process uh, that we, you know, Tuckman's phases have been, uh, you know, kind of the benchmark since the 60s of how we view group development. And they're still valid. There's still things that are discussed and looked at today. They provide a lot of really uh, foundational principles. But then in the 70s, uh, this, this idea came around of what was called punctuated equilibrium. Right. And it didn't start in group work. It started actually with some paleontologists named Niles Eldridge and Stephen Jay Gould in 1972, published this work on what they called punctuated equilibrium, looking specifically at evolution in their in their line of work. They were looking at evolution and the current thinking at that time in 1970s was that evolution was a slow, steady process that that happened over time. And it's kind of just kind of this, again, this slow, steady process, but it happened evenly. It happened steadily over time. Um, and so evolution just took place and, and constant 
small little ways over over however long it was going to happen, right? But uh, Eldridge and, and Gould came along and said, well, that's not really what we see in, in examining these, you know, the, the history of these things, examining the fossils that we see, examining all these things. That what they, have, they saw what they called punctuated equilibrium, which are these rapid progressions in, in evolution all at once. And then a, and then a plateau, a, a steady kind of progression in between those periods. Right? So that's what they call punctuated equilibrium. It was kind of go, 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 and then they remain steady for a long time. And so they, they brought this idea forth in, in the area of evolution and examining evolution, and it really took hold, this idea of punctuated equilibrium. And then fast forward a couple decades to 1991, psychologist and researcher Connie Gersick said, you know, the same thing really applies to, to behavioral sciences, to not just psychology, but the way individuals develop and the way groups develop. And it's not just this linear function that, that we see in uh, represented in Tuckman's phases where, you know, you go through one and on to the next and then on the next and then on the next and so forth. But things are messier than that. It's not really the straight line. What happens if you get new leadership or if you're working on something that's technological and all of a sudden the technology just changes, which happens all the time now, right? The technology just like, nope, we're not doing that anymore. Think of the Blackberry folks. If you can even remember that, if you're old enough to remember Blackberries, all of a sudden Blackberry, Blackberries were the rage. Everybody had to have one as this mobile device, right? Well, then smartphones come along and Blackberries are obsolete. So what do you do if you're Blackberry people? You're not just moving in this linear progression through these different stages and, and constantly staying and performing, right? Things happen, things change where, you know, you may be in, you may have gotten to norming or performing, but all of a sudden something happens and now you're back to storming. You have to regroup, you have to rethink things and you're back to, your group is back to kind of this forming or storming phase. And then eventually, ideally, you're going to enter back into norming and then progress to performing, right? But then you may get back to storming again. And this will all happen in fits and starts. It won't all be a steady progression through a period of time. You know, that straight upward angle that we saw in that evolutionary chart, it'll be kind of this, this ragged thing where we see rapid periods of change and then periods of stability in between there for these different phases. And then we may go back. It may be cyclical. And we may have to go back to these things. So group development isn't just a straight linear thing. We've, we've come to understand that as well. It's much like, much like kids and much like, you know, things they grow differently. Every group is different. They all grow different phases, but we can still identify different, uh, different key principles within each of those phases that are important for us to, to keep in mind. So again, every group is different. But every group is sort of the same. I guess that's the message. Every group does go through these phases if it continues to to progress and become effective. So we can see these markers that we see in the different phases of group development. But at the same time, every group is different. It won't all be just a straight line. They won't all progress through these um, at the same rate. Some will stay in different phases longer. Some will have more success than others. And, and so we need to be aware of that, that we can um, uh, treat every group individually and look at every group differently. But at the same time, we can identify these, uh, these key principles within the development process for each group. If you have questions about uh, group development, or about small group communication in general, please feel free to email me. I'd love to hear from you there. In the meantime, I hope that you can start to apply some of this to your own group work and identify some of the key principles and, and, and phases in your own experiences with groups, maybe groups that you're in right now, and how you can begin to, uh, to um, manage the group process more effectively and participate in that process more effectively by understanding these different phases and models of group development.